that time of year. Am I on, David? Okay, just not strong. It's 272. Would you take a hymnal and join me there? I want to invite you this evening to a special subject, but before I do, uh, when I was thinking about the violence today and the violence that we continue to have around the world, around the country, one of the things that occurred to me is that wherever you have a cheapening of our understanding of human life, you're going to have more violence. Um, our responsibility and accountability for how we handle people, how we relate to other people, is tied to how we understand God and our responsibility before Him. And that's true even if you're a Muslim. <laughs> you know, uh, it is true that not all Muslims are violent. I've known a number of them. I used to fish with one uh, in South Texas uh, when I was pastor there. And he was a good friend. Uh, he didn't want to come to church because he didn't want one of his Muslim friends to see him, but he listened on the radio every week and often commented on things that I said and compared notes with me from his background. As far as I know, he never came to Christ, but uh, he had a good heart, and he was a good father, good husband. But he had a fear of God, and he understood the value of human life. But there are a lot of people who don't seem... To understand that. And I was trying to think of a way of talking about that for just a moment, which in a way is related to what I'm going to share with you tonight. Do you realize that we now have Christian leaders from the United States that are going into Vietnam and sharing the gospel? Did you know that? Did you know that they are welcome there? A friend of mine, a pastor in Dallas uh, who is Vietnamese, has led many mission trips back to his native Vietnam, even though he's an expatriate of Vietnam, who came here in that wave of those who were part of South Vietnam fleeing from the wrath of the Viet Cong. He now is free to go back there and preach the gospel of Christ. Now, how did that happen? I mean, do you remember? Surely you remember the violence and the bloodshed and the bombings Surely you remember that. Surely you remember the protests and all of that that happened in all of that time. And now think about what kind of relationship America has right now with Vietnam. It's still not perfect. I'm not suggesting it is. But you'd be amazed if you really knew uh, how open that door is swinging in Vietnam to share the gospel of Christ and how interested even former Viet Cong, 
Most of them have pretty well died off. How interested they are in the hope that we have in Jesus. Jesus really is the hope for all the people of the world. He's the hope for peace. But uh, we know uh, that too many in our country and other countries reject Him or ignore Him. I was typing a blog in Myanmar. Now I'm starting what I prepared to speak, okay? I was typing, typing a blog in Myanmar. I was sitting at uh, one of those hotel places where they put several computers. There's no such thing as wireless in Myanmar, Burma, uh, if you know it better by that name. And so I'm sitting at, uh, at one of those computers, and uh, I'm basically just keeping a, a running diary and a blog. It's still on the Internet. Uh, from several years back, of the experiences that we had day by day in Myanmar. And a young lady who is sitting at a computer, there's actually one between the two of us, and then she's at a third computer down the desk from me. She leans toward me and she says, I want you to know that I hate everything you stand for. In perfect English. Well, I, I wasn't upset. I mean, you know, I, I've gotten way past letting something like that make me angry. And I said, how do you know what I stand for? And she said, you're a preacher. Well, I didn't have on a preacher shirt, you know, that said preacher on it. I, I'm not sure I had a Bible in there. I might have, but, but the point is, she said, I hate everything you stand for. I said, well, let's talk about that. Come to find out, she was traveling Myanmar with her lesbian lover. And she strongly believed that we, if we share the gospel in a country like Myanmar, we are corrupting a people who already have a religion, who already have a culture, and we're trying to make them a part of our culture. I said, ma'am, don't you understand that Jesus is not an American? I mean, in the days of his flesh, uh, that uh, he is Middle Eastern. Uh, and I said, do you realize how long Christians have been in Myanmar? In fact, did you know that the system of education for this nation was made possible through the efforts of a Baptist missionary named Adoniram Judson who taught them how to write their own language and translated the Bible. He, along with his wife, Anne, translated the entire scriptures into their language. And that was a birth of learning and education to a great extent for a a, a rather primitive people who lived here uh, way back in those days, in the very early 1800s. Well, she didn't budge any, but she at least talked more civilly to me, and we had a couple of other conversations. But here's what I want to say. There are those who oppose the gospel of Christ and think that it ought never to be shared in other nations. We just are adopting this year a $50,000 goal for our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Last year, I think we gave 45000 Now, that's over and above hundreds of thousands that we gave systematically through the cooperative program. Uh, and all total towards 800000 to missions here at Crestview. But uh, the thing that I want you to think with me about is we believe that the whole world needs Jesus. And we don't just say we believe that. We try to do things that indicate uh, that we're serious about it, uh, that we believe everyone needs Jesus Christ. Well, this young woman uh, didn't want the people of Myanmar to know Jesus or be changed by the gospel of Jesus. And the answer to her situation is found in John three nineteen. Light has come into the world, and men and women love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. It's really not about a conflict in religion for some people. It's not about that at all. They really don't want any religion, and they certainly don't want a religion that will hold them accountable for the life choices that they make. Did you know that Buddhism, which of course is a prevalent religion in Myanmar, did you know that Buddhism is becoming increasingly popular on the campus of American universities among Caucasian students? Did you know that? You know why? Buddhism, there's not really a code of ethics. You can pretty well do what you want. There's not a God to whom you're accountable. And so uh, rather than be non-religious, that doesn't work very well. Um, I, I think that uh, Chesterton and Lewis both said uh, that when a man stops believing in God, it isn't that he starts believing in nothing. It, he becomes a person who will just believe in anything. And that's the truth. 
And, and so there's an embracing of Eastern religion, not because of any serious passion for faith, but, but rather to fill a void in some measure without accountability. So this woman, she didn't really care about the religion of the people of Myanmar. She just hated a God that had commandments and that wanted us to uh, be led by His Spirit to a relationship with Jesus and toward a holy life. Well, there is another set of people who are opposed to world missions. I'm going to give you some scripture in a minute other than John 3.19. But did you know that Joseph Sprague, a bishop in the Methodist Church in the state of Illinois, made this statement, and it made the press. He said, it is okay to say that Jesus is your Savior, but it is arrogant to suggest to others that He should be their Savior as well. Now think about that. He went on to say how unlike Jesus it would be to suggest that all people need to put their faith in Christ. What Bible is he reading? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Who said that? Jesus. And many, many other things that he said. His first followers. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven whereby we may be saved. The name of Jesus. That's the message of the gospel. But here's a... A leader in a denomination in America saying, well, it's just rude to suggest people need Jesus. And if you think it's just, I, I, yes, I said Methodist, but if you think it's just them, the head of evangelism in the American Baptist, that's the Northern Baptist, some years ago said it is not our job to tell people that they need to be saved, but to tell them that they have been saved. Where do you get that gospel? Uh, that's not the gospel. Now, certainly salvation is available in Jesus Christ, but if you just go around and tell, oh, by the way, just have a good life, you're already saved, that's, that's not preaching the gospel. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, that's Jesus. How can we profess to be preaching the gospel of Christ when the gospel that we preach contradicts Jesus? And yet, some of that nonsense is going on. And here's what I want you to know. There are others who oppose missions, and for that matter, evangelism. Not like the young woman who said, I hate everything that you stand for. But they oppose a, an exclusive gospel. Well, let me say that Jesus is both exclusive and inclusive. He is exclusive in that there is no other way to be saved except through Him. But He is inclusive in that He's available to anybody. Whatever race, whatever nationality, whatever language, anyone can come to Christ. And interestingly, of the religions of the world, no religion has penetrated so broadly the cultures and languages of the world has had, as has faith in Jesus. Some people say, well, Islam's really growing. Well, you know how Islam's growing? If the average man in your country could have 18 wives and have as many children as he could have by them. How many siblings did Bin Laden have? Was it 58? Something like that, that Bin Laden had of siblings? They're not growing by evangelism, people. They're growing by just having children. That's how they're growing in the world. And they're growing rapidly by uh, this polygamy and, and the fathering of children uh, in great numbers. Now, I'm not saying no one's ever converted to Islam, but you need to understand the demographics of Islam uh, and the way that it has been functioning in the world. So, those who oppose evangelism and missions, because they see it as somehow rude, because they see it as imposing our values on other people here and abroad, trying to change cultures some cultures need changing, folks. They need change. Our culture needs changing. And the cultures of the world need changing. So what's this business of being afraid to affect change in the culture? So here's my question. Does the Bible teach that the gospel of Jesus Christ is for the whole world? You have to look no further than Luke 2.10. 
I bring you good tidings of great joy that shall be for all the people. You know, there are actually scholars who try to rework that passage to say something else. I was reading just the other day from a man who's absolutely convinced that Jesus only came for the Jews. Well, that's utter nonsense. Uh, his disciples knew better than that. And, and this verse attached to our Christmas story says, He came and, and it was good news for all the people. And what did they say? He's a Savior. A Savior. A Savior for all the people. That's why it's good news. And the verse of Scripture that literally has been my marching orders ever since the day that God called me to preach, Romans 1, 16. Anybody quote that without looking it up? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, to be sure they had the first opportunity. Jesus made sure that they had the opportunity to hear the gospel and to respond to Him. But also to the Greek or the Gentile. And that's all the rest of us. All the rest of us. People that the average person in the Mediterranean world at the time that Jesus walked on this earth that, that they didn't even know existed. And yet the good news was for them too. It was for all the people. Good news of great joy. And so the gospel of Christ is for everybody. But in that verse, and that's my key verse tonight, is this issue, and this is a question I want to ask you, how is your confidence in the gospel? How is your confidence in the gospel? I'm not talking about, do you think the gospel is for everybody? I don't think anybody in here, unless you slipped in, you know, we, we had a Wiccan who was coming to our services, uh, our midweek services, a number of years ago. Some of you may even remember this. A Wiccan lady was coming to our midweek services, and uh, she just started blending into the background, and I didn't know everybody in the room even back then. And, and uh, uh, she uh, sent me an email and said, I'm really interested in how God, or I don't, she didn't say God, but how that church, she said, how you are growing that church. And, of course, I didn't know she was Wiccan when she asked me. I said, oh, I'm not growing it. She said, could I come talk to you? I want to start uh, a church, she said. Uh, in Williamson County, and I would like to get some pointers from you about how to build that work up. Well, she then told me in a second email, she said, I'm Wiccan. So then we really had an interesting... So I got up here on a Wednesday night, and I just said, uh, there is a lady who has told me that she's Wiccan who's been visiting our services, and uh, I, I, I just kind of went into a brief talk about exactly what the Wiccan belief is. And she walked up to me after, I'd never seen her before. She walked up to me after the service. She said, I can't believe you called me out in the room. I said, well, you're about the only person in the room that didn't think I would do such a thing. And she came back to my office. We had a very interesting talk. My point is, you might be in here tonight, and you may not think the gospel is for everybody. I don't know how you slipped in the room, you know, but fine, you're here, okay? But listen to me. The question I'm asking you is, not do you think the gospel is for everybody, but how is your personal confidence in the gospel? Now, let me help you answer that question. If you have no confidence in the gospel, missions will lose its purpose for you and ultimately its existence. Do you know that the mainline denominations have almost bowed completely out of world missions? They're not sending anybody to the mission fields. Do you know that there are more independent missionaries that are not really attached to any denomination in particular who come out of non-denominational churches and strong uh, independent churches than there are all of the, of the old mainline denomination churches combined? They, they don't have any missionaries. Because a long time ago, they lost their confidence in missions and evangelism. And if you lose your confidence in missions evangelism, finally it will lose its purpose. You know what they started doing? They started saying, we need to go over there and make sure hungry people have something to eat. Well, that's not bad. But if you feed somebody for the rest of their life and they still die and go to hell, how have you helped them? What have you really done to help them? And so that kind of missions passion 
will always will always die out. You just can't sustain a passion for missions that does not try to reach people with the gospel of Christ. It can't be done. And, and historically, that's proven to be the case. And ultimately, it will cease to exist. Secondly, if you have no confidence in the gospel, you will not share it with others and will find substitutes for sharing your faith. Uh-oh, I'm meddling with you now. If you believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, then who are you telling about Jesus? Who are you? I mean, if you're confident that it's the power of God unto salvation, who are you talking to? Who are you sharing with? How many did you talk to this week? Or is that not fair? Last month, how many people did you... Did you try to impact with that mighty message of Jesus? Through your testimony, maybe, or, or through a word of witness, or through a conversation. So, if you have no confidence in the gospel, you will not share the gospel with others and will find substitutes for sharing. You will determine that Christianity is just being nice to people. By the way, a nationwide poll in America that claims to be Christian, they were asked, what is it about Christianity? What's unique about it? It said they're nice people. You know, I don't think the Pharisees would have said Jesus was a nice person. I really don't. Now, I'm not suggesting we be rude or hateful. I, that's not what I mean at all. But being nice is not being Christian. There are lots of nice people who are nothing of the kind. They are not believers in Christ. They do not have devotion to Him. They are not committed to Him. And so we need to know the difference. And that's a substitute for having confidence in the gospel. Just try to be nice, good neighbor, good friend, you know, and never really try to find ways to touch people's lives with the good news. I hope you got your steel-toed shoes on tonight. If you have no confidence in the gospel, you must also admit that you've lost your confidence in Jesus Christ. You know the right answers. But if you had confidence in Jesus, you would know that He can make all the difference. That there is transformative power in Jesus when He is presented in the power of the Holy Spirit and when we relieve the results to God. Secondly, in what tangible ways are you demonstrating your confidence in the gospel? What tangible ways? One of the basic things that I always teach people, in fact, I had a session on this just this past Monday night with those that are doing our Monday night training. Um, I said that we need to share our faith in daily life, and the basic of that is your testimony. You know, when I used to work with teenagers, and my early pastorates, I was in my early 20s, so... I did the youth work too, and I did a lot of youth work, a lot of youth camps. And one of the things that I would teach young people is don't ever go on a date, the first date, with anybody without sharing your testimony about how you came to Christ. It'll transform the relationship. It may make the relationship go away. That's okay. You want that relationship to go away. But always found a relationship on your testimony. That same goes for a business relationship. That goes for a neighbor relationship. You know, don't carry your neighbor cookies and cake and, 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 and tell them hello in the morning and learn their name and never tell them your testimony because you're cultivating, but you have no intention of planting anything. You're just not planting anything. And the gospel has to be planted. And the gospel is the message of Jesus Christ. And, and you can share a brief testimony in a way that contains the seed of the gospel. What about... An investment of time and resources. I think we do pretty well on that as a congregation. But, but you see, uh, for me to say that I have confidence in the gospel and, and just to do pittance in my support of kingdom things, I'm contradicting. I mean, where's the evidence that I have passion about the gospel? Did you hear about Zuckerberg's decision that he made today? 
what was that, $45 billion? Is that what it was that he and his wife have determined they're going to give away to charities? Might have been more than that. I, I wasn't trying to memorize it. I just heard it on the radio. And when I heard that, I thought, what would happen if the kingdom of God had access to $45 billion? Now, they probably won't get 15 cents of that $45 billion. The vast majority of the charity giving that's done by philanthropists never touches the kingdom of God. Never. And yet the kingdom of God is the only enterprise that can change cultures. Nothing else can. You say, well, pastor, what makes you think it can change culture? Do you know who our ancestors were in Europe, most of us? They worshiped fire. They practiced cannibalism. They ran around with bones hanging on them like earrings and nose rings. They were wild people. That's why they were called barbarians. And early Christian missionaries changed them by sharing the gospel of Christ. And Europe emerged out of that sea of ungodliness and wickedness. Now, I'm not saying everybody was born again. That, you know, I know that didn't happen. But the gospel is so powerful that even those who are not born again are affected by it. And it changes the way that they live. So, yes, the gospel can change cultures. And the tragedy is that uh, we and the world doesn't understand the possibilities that exist. We're actually bringing missionaries home by the hundreds right now. Southern Baptists are, because there is inadequate support for them. How did we get there? Have we lost, even Southern Baptists, have we lost our confidence in the gospel? Let me tell you what, what's happening. That will get me to my third point. I think I've got time for this. What evidence is there that the church you attend has any confidence in the gospel? Now, I'm talking about Crestview, but... But just basically, think about this with me. What kind of mission work do they do? Is their mission work mostly, let's make sure they've got well water, let's dig wells. And I'm not saying that's bad. You know, we worked at a mission in Romania that they'd put a well there and that gave them visibility. But we use that well as a means of sharing the gospel with people. In fact... To get water at that well, you had to kneel in front of a concrete cross. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. The water literally came out of a concrete cross. So what kind of mission work are we doing? Are we doing mission work that is less threatening to ourselves, less unsettling, or are we actually trying to see people come to the kingdom of God? Does the church give sacrificially to missions? I mentioned that earlier. I'm not sure we know how to define sacrificial sometimes. But let me tell you what's happening around the country. Churches are raiding their missions to buy bells and whistles for themselves. Churches that used to give in the hundreds of thousands to missions are giving only a pittance. And it's, it's an epidemic. There are churches in our country who have annual contributions of more than $40 million. Now one church, $40 million in one year, who are giving less than 200000 to missions. That's 100000 less than Crestview's giving to cooperative program right now. Where is the evidence in that situation that they have a passion for the gospel of Christ? That they have confidence in the gospel of Christ and in those who will share the gospel of Christ with the world. Now, what they would say if they were sitting in the room, one of their leaders, pastors, executive pastors, they'd say, well, yeah, but pastor, we send a lot of people on mission trips. You know, sometimes mission trips are just glorified vacations. I'm smart enough to know that. And that's not the same thing as making sure that those in the field are being supplied what they need to do the work that they need to do, like we used to all understand. And finally, do they act locally? 
do they act locally? In other words, it is hypocrisy to give to world missions and talk about people being reached in foreign lands if we have no interest in reaching the community that we're in. It's hypocrisy. We are not reveal, we're revealing something about ourselves that we have no intention of revealing. We're revealing that we talk a good game, but when it comes to our own personal mission, we don't really have one. So, we, we are not all we should be or could be, but I want to tell you something. All over this building right now is evidence of our passion to share the gospel with people who don't know Christ. And do you know who the most fertile field in Georgetown is to hear the gospel and respond? Hispanic families. I mean, when we go out in visitation, some of our teams occasionally will go to a home. There might be seven Hispanic people in one household who will pray to receive Christ. Hear the gospel gladly and respond. We need to understand that, that missions right here where we live is important. And, and all kinds of missions. We've got people around us who are up and out. <laughs> and others who are down and out. And some who are just right on a plane with us. But they have no peace with God. And so the question is not do you believe that the gospel is for everybody. The question is how is your confidence in the gospel. Now let me give you my verse again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's pray. Father, I pray that uh, here in a season uh, of Christmas, when we think about, Lord Jesus, your coming and, and bringing good news for all people, Help us to understand why that connection has been made to think about world missions in this season. And help us, Lord, as individuals and as a congregation, never to allow our vision or our passion to wane, but to fan into flame, Lord, as you led Paul to say to Timothy, to fan into flame that holy fire in our lives and in our churches. And God, how I pray for our churches that they will rediscover the importance of investing in reaching this world with the good news of Jesus. For we pray in His name. Amen.